Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the last event of the day and the last webinar we're doing. Um, my name's Paul Woodward. I work for AAB, which is a financial solutions accounting house that I work within their customs team. Um, for me, I've worked in the industry for 25 years, and I probably look like that because it's been a long time with lots of changes, especially in the post-Brexit world. So today, I'm going to talk you through some of the EU e-commerce reforms that are coming into place, and they are going to be very beneficial for businesses within the e-commerce section. So the first thing I'll look at today is the regulatory changes which are coming on board. First thing is let's just pay attention to some new directives which have been launched out there. We have the Digital Services Act. This is predominantly to monitor your campaigns for marketing that you're doing to make sure that any comments and messages you're saying don't cause offence to any of the consumer base. This is very important so you can be aware of how your marketing messages are being set up and the guidelines that you have to adhere to to make sure you're not offending the end consumers. It's always worth here speaking to obviously who is your provider online so you can clearly understand what messages you're sending and so that they aren't being disrespectful to any other ethnic groups which are out there. The e-commerce directive, now this was recently updated when we left Brexit in 2021, and this is all about how you need to do trade within the EU in any e-commerce channel that you've currently got going. Okay, so this lists the key factors you need to be aware of. And the new one, and the final one that we saw, was geo-blocking. Now geo-blocking is very important. This means that you cannot choose who your country is you're going to sell to. So if you thought German tax authorities are bad, we're not going to sell there. Well, with geo-blocking, if you open up to a couple of EU countries, you have to open up your products to every EU member state. You cannot just decide which countries you would like to sell into because that would be breaking the geo-blocking rules. So again, really important just to be aware of these key directives and obviously we're here you can reach out to us um, at AAB if you need any more details on them. So we're just going to look at some other ones here which have come about since July 2021. We have revised payment services. Every year and every probably two or three months we are seeing updates in e-commerce, e-billing and e-invoices. It is worth tracking people like VAT update, which are clearly on LinkedIn, because there are new electronic invoicing templates which are coming up that you need to be aware of. So what information do you need to display, what you don't need to display? And that's pushing us more within that digital age. There are new rules with the um, cross-border parcel delivery services as well. So if you're moving through fast parcel operators, FPOs, you'll be looking at DHL, TNT, FedEx of the like, even Royal Mail. They're fast parcel operators getting products quickly to market. Again, what we just mentioned before with the geo blocking, this is coming in to make sure it's fair trade and competitive to every EU member state. Traders, online retailers can't choose which markets they would like to enter. We have to open that for all. There are new consumer protection rules. Do remember, I know not a lot of people like it, but we did leave the EU. Um, we do have our own consumer protection laws in the United Kingdom, but there are specific changes within the European Union that you do need to be aware of. And there are new VAT rules for um, selling online for goods and services. So what's the difference? Well, goods is a tangible product that you would move cross borders. Services is if you're going to train someone in another EU member state, if you are going to offer online training services, you need to make sure there is a business that you are qualified under EU law. Just because you have a qualification in the UK does not mean that you can provide that service. So do be aware of those aspects as well. So looking at the, um, the DSA as we refer to it, this is really there and the key principle is to protect the fundamental rights of people online, yeah? We see lots of abuse that we see on 
the news every night of what's happening online, new challenges that the digital world's facing. And this is really here to make sure the rights are protected. It's to make sure that online traders are transparent and accountable on any online platform you use. Online platforms, well, what could that be? Well, the online platform can be your own online website you have, or it could be through fulfillment partners like Amazon or other web services which are out there. It's easier for retailers online to use fulfillment partners because they are responsible for making sure that they are accountable. The worry be there is also for B2C e-commerce traders which run it through their own platform and making sure that you're not breaking any of these rules. This here is a key directive, protect everybody online, but also to generate innovation and growth within the digital sector. When we look at the EU directives, especially for e-commerce, the new legislation and directives were brought in when we left the EU, and they have some basic key requirements that I'd like you to be aware of. It sets out mandatory customer information that you need to be displaying and holding. It also gives you guidance on online activities, advertisements, marketing campaigns that you might r run. So a key question here, if you're visiting some of the stands that we have here, is to look at the service offerings out there. Do they take into account these regulatory controls within any offering that they could be offering with their solutions? It's important to make sure you have the online option, speed, fasty, innovation, but also you don't come foul of any of the legal framework. Another key principle is the internal market clause. And this is here to promote the internal market. What that means, it's protecting the EU market. That's why we see lots of challenges with getting Great Britain goods into the EU. There's taxation, customs duties. This is also there to promote it. We see a lot of this in the US as well, uh, mainly referred down to protectionism. That's the word for it, where you see the US government taking sanctions against China to promote their own industry. This is for the growth of the EU internal market as well, like laws the UK government bring in to safeguard our market. So there are some key changes to be aware of, and these are strictly at a European level, bringing goods to the European marketplace. Um, there is responsibility surrounding artificial intelligence, which you're going to see on a lot of the stall offerings here today. Data management, remember global data protection policies, that came in, heavy fines if you're not accountable, um, which can range into the tens of millions from, for any business. So it has some of the stringent controls in place that we're seeing globally, so it is important just to have key function of how do I operate? What do I need to do? How do I assure compliance? How do I make sure this doesn't cause an issue for our, our business? Key factors in when you're breaking legal framework can be things like fines, penalties. But what about the other main constituent? Well, that is, they could ban you from market access. If you break these rules continuously, you'll be banned from putting your products on the European market. So again, key food for thought today in today's material. Now I want to really look at, that happened in the past. That's what's in place at the moment. But what does the future look for e-commerce? That's why I suppose we're all here at this event. What does it mean? What's on offer? But also, what changes do I need to be aware of? So these are some of the major changes which are coming in from 2024 onwards. We've got changes to e-commerce platforms. These are going to have new impacts in regard to proposed changes and for value-add purposes and VAT. When we're talking about e-commerce platforms, the EU is talking about large businesses. So we're talking over 10, 20 million in revenue. So if you're servicing your product portfolio through an online operation like Amazon, they will have to have and put these controls in place. Yeah? The European Commission also looked at proposals, really, for the tax landscape as well. 
And this is where, you know, the biggest changes are going to happen, especially if you're bringing products onto the market. Think about what it's like to be outside the EU. Yeah? If, you're, if you don't come under the current thresholds, you have to have presence in that country or have a third party act on your behalf. You've got 26 member states now. Each one you may need a representation in. Is the business big enough? And with the geo-blocking laws, that means that you can't discriminate and not go to certain European countries. You have to open it up for everyone. And that's an important factor to be aware of. Obviously, we've had the pandemic. We've seen multiple growth now within e-commerce sales, people more tailoring their needs and their demands to what can they do on their laptops, their smartphone, or their tablets. It's the way forward, and that growth is not going to slow down. So it's imperative that we see platforms defining underneath the regulations that are coming in place. One which is really pertinent and really from the changes that we have seen is when we left the EU, we had the import one-stop shop. That meant if your shipments were under 150 euros, you can use that mechanism to pay your VAT in a European country monthly by online reporting, which is great for e-commerce. It helps us move businesses. But the great news is that this is going. So the threshold of 150 euros per shipment is being abolished. What does that mean? Well, it means you're not restricted anymore. The import one-stop shop will become a mandatory VAT platform, yeah? Don't need to pay people for that. It's a site available as long as you're registered in one EU country and you don't have to have residents there to open it up. Most people look at the language. So they'll look at the Republic of Ireland, Holland, applying through those platforms they are in the same English, they're in English, um, they're also very structured from a software perspective. Once you've registered there and you have a third party to act as indirect representation, it means that if you have a shipment to a consumer, if it was 300 euros, with this still in place, you wouldn't be able to use the import one-stop shop. You may have to pay VAT in country, customs duty, and not be able to reclaim it. Yeah, it's, you'd have to add that as a value add and increase your sales figure, which you're proposing online to your end customers. That gives European traders a competitive edge because they can charge less, potentially poach your customers. But with this abolishment, it is a great way forward, meaning that doesn't matter what your shipment value is, it will be mandatory and you can account for your VAT in country online on a monthly basis. So that's something that we really want to know and the key message that we see today. So, what dates are we looking at? So from 2028, platforms will be used instead of EU consumers and they will be responsible for ensuring customs duties and VATs are being paid. So this is maybe an integration into how you're accounting for VAT as your business, especially overseas where you're trading, especially with the EU member states. VAT and duties will become due when the platform receives payment. So if someone goes on, they add to their shopping cart, they say, yes, thank you, I'll have that next Wednesday, that's what I'm looking for. When that checkout's done and you take payment, that will trigger the VAT payment. These can be triggered with then a monthly return you will do through the online IOSS reporting. So again, very important to think about this and what you can do to bring that in place. This will actually give us greater transparency and it removes an unfair competitive edge that the EU member states had over e-commerce activities from Great Britain. So again, it's a very much welcome change and one we've been trying to promote as a business with the EU Commission for probably the last two years, so it is welcome news. Under the legislation, we also have what we call fiction goods. So these aren't like novels where one's fictional or non-fictional or science fiction. Um, this is about deemed responsibility. So if you have a tax agent in a country, they will do your tax reporting. 
but they won't take physical control of the goods, they won't own them, they won't pay you any money for them, they are fictional, so therefore they don't exist. And they don't exist because they're just a party to help you with your VAT compliance. This is what this is referring to here. And the VAT fictions or this deemed provision, you know, is going to make it responsible for the platform itself. So big platforms, Amazon, they'll need to have this in place for your VAT requirements and obligations. Customs duty, so the other part of indirect tax. We all see we have import VAT, different rates in every other EU member state. We do have two European countries, um, the Netherlands and Republic of Ireland, which do do postponed VAT accounting. What that means is you can import and then you account for it at your next quarterly return. You don't pay for it as delivery is made, which is a massive um, cash flow benefit for any business. This will be rolled out within the rest of the EU. It is with their tax authorities, but we are seeing Spain, France, Germany now taking a lead on that. So potentially options in the next couple of years to use that functionality. Remember, from 2028, all platforms, um, they will log their sales into a new centralized online system, which is going to be mandatory, and this will be called the EU Customs Hub. This is where you're going to account for your VAT and any customs duties. One way you can remove customs duties is if your product is manufactured in the UK. From that, you can use the free trade agreements out there because it doesn't matter as long as it's made in the UK and you've had some processing, you would qualify under preference and not pay any customs duty to any EU member state. That's very important as well to be aware of. There will be no declaration for any specific parcel. It will just be your sales you've made during that monthly period, which you will then pay your VAT and customs duty through the centralised hub that I've mentioned. Again, the current threshold of 150 euros. This will be eliminated and the scheme will be mandatory. It's not mandatory at the moment. It's up to a GB operator if they want to use it. This will become mandatory in this period of time and how you will account for VAT within those areas. Another key factor here is really the simplified duty. So tariff treatments will be introduced for any business to consumer sales of goods that are imported from 2028. There will be a simplified duty approach there. This will mean that we'll be looking at further tariff classification, so how your goods are classified with customs, which will give you some relief, yeah? And tariff treatment will be applied on a voluntary basis rather than who the importer is. That's a big factor as well, allowing you to manage that cost more effectively. So again, think about how the world operates today. We ship goods, we pay import VAT, maybe by a third party, a DHL. We pay customs duty. From 2028, this is going to be simplified so it's accounted for on a monthly basis. You won't have to pay when it arrives in country. Now, that's great if you've got delivered duty pay terms, the Amazon term, as I called it, when a customer places an order and just expects delivery on Thursday. This helps with that and extra ancillary costs and charges you might get from any third parties. So, what are the next steps, we say? Well, the European Parliament at the moment still need to approve these proposals, but they have been put forward. A bit like when the UK was trying to leave the EU and we had to agree all new legislation ourselves. It is very positive and the first implementation will start in 2025. We are fast approaching 2024. The idea is look at your business model see where it lies and obviously understanding what do you need to change what are the changes in the first fee three directives i mentioned that could pose you issues and how do you comply with them these are key questions you should be asking can we do that through automation through many of the service providers here key questions to ask them if you're interested in how they operate remember 
The new e-platforms such as Dean Seller Status will be active from 2028. So we are giving you a viewpoint of how e-commerce sales in Europe will look in the future. Giving you that snapshot of what do I need to prepare for. You should also evaluate the effects of removal of customs duty relief from 2028. If you've got less additional costs, that means you can offer your product cheaper. That means you're more competitive with your European customers. It gives you a driver to really benefit and use the EU market as an extra sales channel. Thinking about the days of Brexit has happened, the challenges we faced in the last two years are going through this simplification and making sure that every country in the world, UK, EU, USA, are all on an even playing field, which is really key and it opens up great opportunities in competitive markets. Assess the correctness of your data, yeah? What data are we presenting? Is it right with e-commerce for invoicing in every country we're selling to? The European mandate sets out what's needed across the EU member states. Every tax authority will have different stipulations, but that's the beauty of the EU. It's rolled out through all states. And as long as you comply with the minimum and have the right data sets, you will be compliant in every way. Look at the readiness of your current systems to exchange any data, especially for these online VAT records through the EU, EU hub that we're looking at, the centralised location. What do my data sets need to be? How am I going to do that? Am I going to channel that through monthly APIs of core data and then pay my VAT bill? How's that going to work? There's probably a time now where we need to think, well, what's our strategic roadmap? What's our low-hanging fruit? What are the key factors we need to think about to make sure as a business we are ready and we can take advantage of these regulations being removed and simplified? And further, just look at automation of your processes as well. You know, please be aware of the service providers here. We're not here selling anything. We're just giving you an idea of how that is going to work in the future. If you want to reach out to us and ask us questions, by all means do so. But again, there's no sales pitch. It's telling you how the revolution for e-commerce is starting on its second journey within Europe. That's all from me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was useful. Um, I'll open the floor to any questions that you may have and I'll step away in case anyone who wants any slides to take photos, okay? Hello. Hi. Um, just so I'm clear on the removal of the 150 in yeah. terms of the duty relief, does that mean there's a new de minimis or where you're essentially paying duty from anything above zero? Sorry, that's me. It's like not unmuting yourself on a Teams call, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> you know that one, yeah? So, um, yeah, with that, it doesn't, the valuation is of your goods. It doesn't take into de minimis. It just means that any value, if your shipment is above the 150 threshold, that's being removed. So it doesn't matter now. I had one client that sold leather jackets. Every leather jacket was 200 euros. He could never use this scheme. He can in the future. Yeah, so de minimis is important. So if you look at other things which are changing, if you have the US as, as customer base, they have a de minimis ruling whereby you can import it into the US as long as it's for an end consumer and you pay no customs duty. Yeah, so de minimis doesn't come into the EU version of this. It just says, do you know what? Even level playing field, we're removing the threshold. We're going to make platforms more accountable and we're going to let more competitive nature occur within the marketplace. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Oh. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I'm not quite clear on one thing. You mentioned we're going to make platform, or they're going to make platforms more accountable. Sure. Who is platforms? Is it the website that sells? Is it the platform, the e-com platform that provides the tool to sell online? Who is, is Amazon? I mean, it, imagine that we sell through a marketplace which is Amazon. We also sell through uh, our website on, for example, Shopify. 
Uh, who is this platform responsible and more accountable? Great question. So, yes, yeah, so the platforms they're talking about for the regulations, as I mentioned, is anything over 10 to 40 million pounds in turnover or that has more than 100,000 employees. So when we're looking at that, it's a big sourcing provider, as you may see here, with their stalls helping you with your e-commerce solution. If it's your own website you've got, you wouldn't be under that threshold and not underneath those platform requirements. Is that clear, yeah? Hello, um, can you just give some more detail on geo-blocking and what that exactly means in terms of as a business, you may be ready to launch in a, in a new territory, yeah. but you're not ready to launch in multiple <laughs> territories. Can you just give some more explanation around what it means in terms of reality for a business and how, how they can ensure they're not breaking any laws around geo-blocking? Yeah, sure. Great question. Thank you very much. So, yeah, geo-blocking is all about product offering. So if you've got, and this is really EU, it's not global, yeah? We may see this movement more with other groups like in the Trans-Pacific Partnership in the um, ASEAN area, so APAC and CAP. But what this means is if you have product offering, when you've got the ship to location, yeah, what countries you service, you can't have Germany and France and nothing else in Europe, yeah? What that means is that if your product's on there for sale to Europe, it has to be available to ship to every EU member state. You can't be, what they're telling you in the real world is, if someone went on there and said, right, I'm in Slovakia, I want to buy this product, I love it, price is great, I just want to get this. If you don't give them their country as a drop-down menu, you are geo-blocking them based on their location. Yeah. So if your product is free for sale in Europe, it has to be open as a drop-down for countries you ship to for all of the member states. Is that, is that okay, yeah? <laughs> what they're trying to do is make sure that we don't have any anti-competitive anti nature. If a product's going to be sold in the EU and they all come under CE product labelling, if you're going to sell to France, your product would already be attested, so it should be free to everybody in the EU to purchase. So you can't then... And I think what happens with the geo-blocking and one of the arguments here was, well... If we've got geo-blocking and I'm selling to Germany and my products are, let's say, 300 euros, my favourite value today, then because you're over that threshold, you'd have to be registered for VAT or have a third party to pay it. So if we're going to make products available to every EU member state, we need to remove the 150 euro threshold. If you're asking us to supply everyone, you can't limit us because the value of our goods is over the threshold. If you think about other consumers, you could have a shopping cart that you're putting all the products in. It could come to 151 euros. So what, I've got to split the shipment? Two shipment costs? Am I going to lose money and not pass that on to the end consumer? They're key things of why the changes are happening and why they had to put further changes in in the future. Okay? Everything that we've discussed uh, seems to have related to physical goods. Um, how does all of this relate to software where the purchase is just a, a click and a download? Okay, yeah, perfect, great question. So this is more mainly goods surrounding, um, but the one-stop shop is open if you are doing, it will be mandatory and there won't be a value if you're, if you're doing consultancy, if you're giving advice if you're a solicitor or a lawyer or if you've got a great platform that someone's subscribing to and let's say it's a thousand pounds a month you wouldn't have you wouldn't meet the threshold currently so what it's doing is allowing you a way to obviously be aware of how to pay your VAT so it also does cover it on a services perspective but one thing you really need to be aware of is the rules of supply within trade because if you're doing services and you're selling and you're, that subscription's to a company in Germany, for instance, yeah? Rules of supply state that the person responsible for the VAT is actually the German customer. So they would pay the VAT because they're registered in that country and it would be part of their VAT return. 
So you can, that's one thing you do need to consider with the rules of supply, which the rules of supply are out there, they're out there by the World Trade Organization. They state if it's a business to business, business to consumer, and different rules for goods and services about, you know, who owns what, who we, who's, who's responsible for paying the VAT. And they are completely different for goods and services. Goods will use INCO terms, who's responsible for what, who's the importer. But with services, it's where that supply takes place, who you are supplying. That puts the VAT obligations on the recipient rather than the person providing the service. Is that okay? By all means, speak to me at the end. I can give you my details, and then we'll happily have a free chat online and take you through all the rules of supply. Does that work? Yeah? Thank you. I've got to be nearly out of time, surely, because there's loads of questions. But if anyone's got any more, then just come and speak to me at the end. Have a great time at the show, and I hope you found the changes helpful. We'll also be making the slides available, so if you're showing interest, come and see me, and I can email them to you after the event, okay? Thank you very much, everyone.